Our reading today comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 18. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths, and be not wise in your Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then the barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son whom he delights. Blessed is one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing can desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand in her left are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. The word of the Lord. Hey, give it up for Lexa. Good job, girl. She's, uh, she's awesome. Uh, my name is Rico, and I am the youth pastor here in Darien. Welcome, one and all. Good to be with you. Um, I, uh, I have a question for you, and uh, I'm going to ask you to dig up a memory. So... Um, when you get the memory, don't share it. Just keep it, chew on it silently. Um, so when's a, when's a time in your life when you thought, this is it, this is what it's all about, right here? You got it? I want to tell you about uh, a time that comes up uh, in my mind. Uh, it was when I was in high school. I just got Murdoch. Maybe you'll see Murdoch up here. Where's Mur- oh, There he is. Hey, Murdoch. <laughs> He was uh, a 93 Buick LeSabre white Tic Tac model, ran on uh, dreams and the Holy Spirit, and uh, he's a faithful one. And uh, I had just gotten Murdoch, and uh, there was this girl, Jess, who I thought was really cute, and um, I heard that she was watching the movie Bend It Like Beckham. Anybody? All right, just me. Okay, thank you. Um, we, uh, so we went, we watched it. Uh, it was a pretty good movie, but anyway, I was definitely there, not for the movie, but to take Jess home in Murdoch, right? And so I'm like, Jess, after the movie's done, wait right here. I'll be right back. She had no idea what was coming. She, you know, and so I get, I find Murdoch. I get in, I get inside. I make sure everything's nice and clean, pick the right music, turn it up just enough, roll down the window, uh, get my posture right, put the elbow out, get the hand up here, and, uh, and then I, I find Jess, and I just kind of pull up to the sidewalk just dramatically. You could hear the bass just, right? You could almost feel it. And then I just look at her, don't even say a word. But she, on the other hand, looked at me and said, where'd you get that? <laughs> what? That's not how it's supposed to turn out. Man, I thought I was just deflated like a balloon, just kind of everything, all the energy. I don't even know if I took her home. I think I might have just driven away. <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't work out. But, but seriously, what is this all about? How do we know if we're doing this right, this life? How, are we, how do we know if we're really living life well? And before we really launch in, I, want, I just want to acknowledge that there is a ton of wisdom here uh, collectively. I mean, if, if I had it my way, we would all have some kind of warm beverage in our hand, and we would just be able to talk about this question with each other, and that would be church, and we would say amen and get out of here. But I have the mic. That's not how we're going to do it. I got the mic today, so I'm going to share uh, a few cents. I'm going to put my, uh, a couple of cents in the, in, the, in, the, in the plate, and then, you know, it's my humble offering um, of thoughts. But we're going to look at, um, this morning, we're going to look at, look at a central question, it's, and the question is, how does the wisdom of God help us experience the good life? And before we really hone in on that question, I just want to review quickly. Um, we are in, uh, this is the third week of our wisdom series. Uh, it's part of Yobel, or the year of biblical literacy that we're doing at Trinity Church. And so um, if you haven't already, uh, check out some of the resources that are available um, through our year of biblical literacy uh, page. I think it's on the website. And you have access to the Bible Project, which puts out 
amazing, sharp, concise, beautiful uh, videos that are very informative, very engaging. And uh, I find the video on the Wisdom series um, that we're going to talk about in a second really, really helpful. And so check it out if you haven't already. But Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes are the three books in the Bible that comprise the wisdom tradition. It's the wisdom literature. Um, there are collections of sayings and poetry and, and stories, and um, they, uh, they each offer different uh, perspectives on the questions around the good life. How do we live this well? How does one live life well? And each of them offer a slightly different take. Proverbs, uh, where we'll be living uh, uh, this, week, uh, this weekend, this morning, uh, offers us a well-defined clear edge perspective on how to live life well. The message kind of goes like this. If you live life wisely, according to God's uh, boundaries, according to God's design, life will go well for you, right? It's kind of formulaic. A plus B equals C. Um, Alan Valentine, a couple weeks ago, defined wisdom. Uh, I thought it was a really great definition. He said, wisdom is simply doing and saying the right thing at the right time. Love it. That's so crisp and clear. And he challenged us to ask God for wisdom and to develop it through spiritual disciplines. Now, last week we looked at Job. Uh, Job is absolutely a different take on this whole question of of what what does it mean to live well. And Ben did a great job of taking us through Job and a real hard look at pain and suffering and how do we live life well in the midst of pain and suffering. And, And he led us considering how the story of Job calls us to reject simplistic answers to be real with our pain, and to contend for hope in the midst of suffering. And then next week, we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes, and you'll see that in Ecclesiastes, there's a perceived randomness of life, and brevity, the brevity of life is considered, and even the inevitable death, you know, the end of life. It's kind of a darker book, but um, it still asks the question, how to live life well when life is messy? Because the Bible knows what we know intuitively, that life is messy. It's beautiful, Sure, but it's often unpredictable. It's chaotic uh, and broken. I'm thinking about, you know, just all the headlines, the, the, West Virginia, the, the Virginia Beach shooting that happened a couple of days ago. I mean, just another example of just kind of makes you ask, how, how does that happen, right? What, what's going on? And so the, the, the Bible affirms that. The Bible holds that up. The Bible doesn't try to hide that. It confesses it openly, Life is messy. That's actually why I love reading the Bible. It's precisely why, because it doesn't offer neat, pat answers for our deepest life questions. Um, And so before we we dive into our text, I just want to take one one last pit stop to clarify a few terms around our central question. We're focusing on the question of how, uh, how does the wisdom of God help us experience the good life? And so I have a question for you. What's the good life to you, just off the bat? How would you define it? What comes to mind? I have a few pictures up here that um, kind of marketing, uh, the marketing world uh, sells us kinds of pictures of good life. And and maybe maybe it's the comfortable life. Uh, Maybe you think of, when you think of the good life, you think of the interesting life, adventurous, things that you can write home about. Maybe it's the pleasurable life where you just kind of sit and cuddle up and have coffee. That's actually where I like, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe it's the instant life or the microwave life where just things happen, right? Um, maybe it's the entitled life or the hard-earned life where you've earned it. Maybe it's the impressive or the high-achievement life, the perfect life. I saw a survey of, of Darien, the Darien community. It was a community-wide service, and one of their community values is the perception of perfection, meaning uh, uh, the good life is the perfect life. If I look perfect, then I'm doing something right. Maybe that's, maybe that's true. Maybe that's what you think of. And, you know, if you're like me, these pursuits can leave you flat and disappointed and empty and maybe even wounded. And they might satisfy for a time. There's a reason why these things are attractive to us. But by themselves, they eventually fizzle out. You know, the vision of Scripture uh, presents, uh, uh, the, the vision that Scripture presents of a life lived well is actually checkered. You know, we know the heroes of the Bible. Uh, I'm thinking about King Solomon and King David, and we read their, uh, about their victories, but we know their flaws when we read, when we read those portions of Scripture. Uh, the prophets, we, we studied the prophets a couple of weeks ago and how, how um, beautiful their poetry is and just how, um, 
how authentic and how, how they live lives of integrity and, and spoke truth to power, but we knew, we, we see the hardship that they lived. And what about Jesus? I mean, if you're ever in doubt about what the answer is, just say Jesus, and you're probably going to be right, right? Uh, but we know the sacrifice that he lived. We know how hard life was. He was misunderstood and marginalized and betrayed and abandoned. And yet, Scripture holds these lives up as, as, um, as a life lived well. The heroes and their lives testify that the good life is actually about the individual and collective participation in God's restorative justice project through regular daily deeds in favor of the flourishing of everyone and everything on this earth. That's a mouthful. We're going to unpack that a little bit. Proverbs 1, 1 to 3 says this, just to highlight um, uh, Scripture's vision for a good life. Proverbs 1, 1 to 3 says, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity. The prophet Micah, uh, I love how the message says this, the message translation, but the prophet Micah 6, 8 says this, but God's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love and don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. The Bible's vision for the good life. Jesus himself describes the kind of life that he hopes for, for us, for you and me. In John 10.10, 10, it's a, maybe you've heard this verse before, one of my favorites. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy, Jesus says. I came so that they can have real and eternal life that can start now, by the way, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. The Bible's vision of the good life is a life characterized by justice and equity for all, shared resources, compassion for self and others, uh, and a right-sized opinion of oneself. And these are just goalposts, by the way. These, these are, these are um, lofty, big ideas that probably each deserve their own book, but they are just goalposts. I'm just trying to set the course here. And, to, and I want to highlight, too, that within these goalposts that Scripture lays out, there's plenty of room for great diversity of educational backgrounds and um, income brackets and expression of the faith. I mean, we all have a shot at this thing. No one is disqualified from the good life. And so our goal today is just to offer some guiding principles rather than tidy rules or answers. Uh, and really, um, at the end of the day, experiencing the, we experience the abundant life, the good life of Jesus, to the degree that we participate. This is a participatory thing. And to, to the degree that we participate in God's movement for a flourishing world, we will experience the good life. And so again, our central question is how does the wisdom of God help me, help us experience the good life? And uh, in our text, we're going to see four invitations, okay? God's wisdom invites us to look for God. Say, look for God. God's wisdom invites us to release empty promises, God's wisdom invites us to embrace rich values. Embrace rich values. And lastly, you're doing great. God's wisdom invites us to trust in God. So the first invitation, we're invited to look for God. The scripture says, acknowledge God in all our ways. The meaning of the word acknowledge is to know, to study, to experience. And the implication is that we would seek to know God in all we do. So how are, we, how are you looking for God in these situations? How can you and I be proactive in our experience of God? You know, often we can be reactive, can't we? Uh, waiting and just hoping, fidgeting, waiting for God to hopefully encounter us if he loves us or if we're good enough or if we say the right prayer at the right time in the right way. But this is really about a life posture, one that receives what I believe God wants to share with us this morning, and that is God, God says, come, acknowledge me, because I am always with you. Uh, we can pray a prayer like, give me eyes to see you and ears to hear you today, now in this situation. I like what Alan Valentine said a couple of weeks ago, that when I pray, coincidences happen. Isn't that great? There's something about it that when we look for God, God seems to be at work. 
And when we don't look for God, we might even forget that he exists. So let's look for God. Second invitation. The wisdom of God invites us to release empty promises. The scripture says, be not wise in your own eyes. And you know, if you're like me, you tend to trust uh, unflinchingly almost in your own perspective of the world, like the way you see it is just the way it is. But isn't it true that we need to acknowledge our blind spots, that maybe we just got it wrong? Uh, I guess this is where, where I'll make the marriage joke, like if you're married, you know that, but I won't. So, um, but really, this whole idea of being not, not being wise in our own eyes is a reference to, the, to what happened in the garden. Uh, humanity in the garden saw the fruit and saw that it was pleasant and desirable for gaining wisdom. And the temptation was, in fact, to be like God and to define the boundaries of life on our own. That was the temptation. And so eating the fruit was an act of rebellion, not because it was bad for them or had too much you know, gluten or whatever, but it's because it was an act of self-sufficiency. It was an act of self-sufficiency. That's the rebellion. And so to not eat of the fruit would have been really a statement of preserving a deep dependence on God. I have um, a story. Bless you. I have a summer uh, story. Last summer, I got a sty in my eye. Anybody? No? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for your vulnerability. They're like, yeah, we got it. Uh, we can talk about it later. Um, and it turns out that uh, they are produced often because of lack of sleep and stress. And the reason I was uh, a little more stressed than usual and I wasn't getting enough sleep is because I um, ventured last summer to begin a, an, an intense self-improvement regiment. Surprise, surprise, right? I mean, I need self-improvement. And so I was getting up extra early uh, to not catch a train at 4 a.m., but just I, I would be getting up at 4 a.m. to just kind of journal and read and write my book and do whatever, which I haven't written yet, so that's, that's that. But I was, going, I was getting up extra early and still going to bed late, and so it wasn't sustainable, and I wasn't getting enough sleep, and I was tired, and I was rubbing my eyes. Therefore, the bacteria was getting in my eye, and I got the sty. And if you're not... Um, grossed out yet, stick with me. Um, the reason I'm telling you uh, about my sty in my eye is because it's an example of how I tend to pursue my own vision of the good life. This is the empty promise that I was pursuing. You ready? Minimum margin, maximum impact. I am wired to try to cram 50 hours into a 24-hour day. And I get styes. You know, self-help books, entrepreneur YouTube channels, blogs, there's so much that we have access to that can be chock full of empty promises of the good life. Another way that the good life is often imagined or described is the American dream, and it goes something like this. Work hard and you can achieve anything. Everyone has the opportunity to do it. So what's that for you? What is it for you? What's the good life? What's coming up for you? In an article, uh, Pastor Ross Lester, who was a pastor in South Africa, he writes um, about his time ministering in the suburbs of South Africa. I didn't know South Africa had suburbs, but they do. And uh, he um, brings up common characteristics of that suburban life, but or, um, that suburb life. But I think it's interesting because it, it kind of highlights values that we would probably, most of us in this room, associate with the good life. And uh, he, he points out a, uh, several, but I, I, I highlighted three. He points, about, he points out independence uh, as a value of the suburb life, um, but then he talks about how it leads often to isolation. And uh, he talks about comfort and how it often leads to apathy. And he talked about achievement and how it can often lead to anxiety because after all, aren't we only as good as our last achievement? None of these, of course, and independence, comfort, and achievement are inherently bad, but they often become the ultimate goals of our existence. They often leave us with styes in our eyes and confused as to why we aren't still satisfied. The scripture starts to uh, offer us a little promise. It says about wisdom that it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Wisdom will help us flourish. And that's what this whole thing is about. God is making a world in which all of creation, all creatures can flourish. And we flourish as we participate in God's project. That's what, that's what the wisdom is all about. That's where this whole thing points. 
And so being aware of God, looking for God, and releasing these empty promises puts us in a position to embrace a new vision, a new story. Which, and so our next <laughs> invitation is that wisdom, that the wisdom of God invites us to embrace the rich values of the good life. We've released empty promises, and now we can embrace the rich values of the good life. The scripture reads, wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Say blessed. blessed. Okay, I'm going to talk about that idea of blessed in, in a second. But the, the, the imagery of a tree comes up again and again in scripture. We see it all the time, and it's, it's kind of a classic image of things that are flourishing, that are alive, that are producing fruit, good fruit. The wisdom of God is a source of productivity and life and growth and vitality for those who hold on to it. And I had you say the word blessed. The word blessed in the, in the original Hebrew, quick lesson, is ashar. Say ashar. Ashar, very good, which means to go straight or to go on or to advance. It's often translated into English as happy. And so the general idea here of blessed is fulfillment. And it highlights uh, the idea of a straight way as opposed, as opposed to a crooked way. The, the wisdom of God leads us forward in fulfillment and deep satisfaction, come what may. Now, uh, we were talking about the nuance of life before, and, and it's true with the wisdom of God too. And it's, uh, the wisdom of God, uh, of God is often counterintuitive. It leads us to do things that are actually opposite of our default self-sufficient tendencies, it often doesn't actually make sense on paper. A quick story, uh, I used to be a teacher in New Jersey. It was a dream job. I was a high school Spanish teacher, and I was a soccer coach. Um, it was amazing. I thought, I'd, I thought I was set for life. And then I started to volunteer for this organization called Young Life. Um, then I got a taste for, oh my gosh, I think I need to stop teaching and pursue this full-time ministry thing. Uh, pursue it. Don't get too close to anyone who's crazy enough to do full-time ministry, but I just couldn't shake the sense that God was moving me this way. And so when I announced it to my parents, they looked at me like I was crazy and it didn't make sense. And I couldn't answer any of their logistically oriented questions of how this was going to work. All I could say was, uh, I feel called. I feel that's all, that's the only language I had. But anyway, I moved here to Stanford to start and lead this thing called Young Life in Stanford for six years. Then I met my wife and now I'm here at Trinity and I'm doing this thing and I'm in front of you right now and, it, and it's working out. But when I look back, I would not, I mean, I could not have told you this was going to happen. I don't think anyone could have. And, and isn't that true of the wisdom of God that sometimes, many times, it doesn't seem like it makes sense because we can't see where it's leading necessarily. Uh, it's been said that God draws straight and crooked lines. I love that. Lester argues, back to the article, Ross Lester, our uh, South African pastor, he argues that the good life has a different set of values. And so to pursue the good life, we need to release the promise of independence, the, the empty promise of independence, and embrace the rich values of vulnerability and community. Ben was talking about groups before. Groups is a great place to practice this vulnerability and community. Uh, Lester goes, we, can we need to release the empty promise of comfort and, em and embrace the rich value of life-giving sacrifice. We need to release the empty promise of achievement and embrace the rich values of grace and forgiveness. I bet you thought I was done talking about my sty, but we're, we're going back there. Back to the sty situation. This is what I learned about wisdom from the sty situation. I told you that I, I needed to release the minimum uh, margin, maximum impact, empty promise, right? I was releasing that. And this is what I was learning to embrace. The, the rich value of eliminating hurry and doing only what's essential, which is absolutely fundamentally counter my wiring to do what's essential. I want to try to eat the entire elephant all at once, okay? Like, I don't think about it. I just go for it, right? And so, um, but what I was learning in protecting margin, I was affirming that God is God and I am not. Uh, isn't that good? In protecting margin, I'm affirming that God is the one at work in the world, and I, we, get to participate in a small but significant way. 
But how often do we flip that? I mean, think about it. Our, our, even our Christianity just kind of gets that on its head where all of a sudden it's like we run the world and maybe hopefully God can like chip in every once in a while, right? And we end up praying prayers like, Lord, bless this mess. Guilty. The fourth invitation from our text is really undergirded but by the previous three. The fourth invitation is the wisdom of God invites us to trust in the Lord. We are invited to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, the center and core of our beings. Uh, trusting in the verse is, is contrasted with our tendency to lean on our own understanding. And really, we lean on the thing that we trust. We lean on the things that we trust. And so what are you leaning on these days? The thing we lean on when our legs give way, when we're weary, or even when things are going fine and not too bad, when we're disappointed or we're looking for really good things, the things that we lean on are ultimately what we trust. Show me what you lean on and I'll show you what you trust in. Can I let you in on a little secret? All right. Stop, stop the tape. Don't stop the tape. Um, I actually experience uh, an allergic reaction, not literal, but metaphorical. Um, no more sty. I, I won't talk about the sty anymore. Uh, I actually experience an, an allergic reaction uh, when someone tells me in, a, in my time of like distress, hey, just trust in the Lord. Um, and, and I want to acknowledge that the, the good intention of that person, maybe we've been that person. I know I have often because it's true. I mean, ultimately, we want people to trust in the Lord. It's a good thing. If you tasted that, you know that it's good. And so that's, it's a true thing. But uh, in my time of working with students, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, the, the, the glaze that kind of falls over their eyes when, you know, the, the young man is heartbroken about his girlfriend, and I'm like, hey, man, you just got trust in the Lord. It's like, you want to you wanna see someone who looks like he's going to punch you in the face. I mean, it, it's just not helpful, because what does that even mean, right? It seems so nebulous and impossible and intangible. But the three previous invitations that we covered to look for, to release, and to embrace we do those three things and we will just end up trusting in the Lord because those are practical things to do to trust God. You know, the wisdom uh, of God as presented in Proverbs can appear simplistic and formulaic. It can appear to say to those at the top, well done, you must be doing something right. And it can also appear to say to those who, who wish they were at the top, you must be missing something, try harder. If anyone's gotten that advice, you know, struggling in math, and the teacher says, try harder. Oh, oh thank you. That's, that's great. That's helpful, right? Um, the wisdom literature of the Bible pokes holes in the very concept of being at the top. There is no top. Disaster can strike at any moment. We all die, and we can't take our stuff with us. And so if you think you're at the top this morning, you're not. Good news. Because there's no top. If you're wishing you were at the top, stop it. <laughs> there's no top. Brilliant. Let God be God. You be you. And pursue the good life. Pursue the shared life. The diverse life. The life that fights for justice and equity for all people. The missional life. Pursue the sacrificial life. The right-sized life. Pursue the generous life. The gracious life. Let's pursue the good life. And so as we land the plane, this is the, the, the big idea, the so what for today. If you don't remember anything else, um, I pray, God, let them forget the sty. And remember this, our wisdom often leaves us empty, but God's wisdom offers us the good life, the abundant life. And here's what I want you to do with that, think about doing. Let's trust God by looking for God, releasing empty promises, and embracing the rich values of the good life. And so in each situation this week, we're, gonna, we're all going to encounter different situations this week. Let's ask these questions. These are just principle questions. How can I look for God in this situation with this person? What empty promises do I need to release here in this unexpected situation that came up at work? 
How can I embrace the values of God's good life in this situation? You know, if you're like me, your tendency after hearing a sermon is to try to figure out how to make this happen pronto, right? After brunch, you're going to go and brainstorm how to make wisdom a thing, right? And we're going to do it, and we're going to make an app out of it, and we're going to, you know. (laughs) But here's the good news. Here's the good news, because I think if you're like me, what's underlying that is uh, uh, an insidious belief that God is holding wisdom and the good life in front of me like a carrot stick that I'm never going to get. And that is so false about God. That's not, that's not who God is. And so this morning, receive this good news, that God is more for you than you are for yourself. When you look for God this week, know that God's been looking for you since the beginning. As you release empty promises this week, know that God lovingly is showing you those things to release. As you embrace the rich values of the good life this week, know that God delights to embrace you at each turn. That is the life message of Jesus. That's our Lord. That's the propelling wind of the good life. Let me pray for us. So God, we look for you. Uh, We release the things that you're showing us. Give us courage, God, it's scary. Um, Give us courage. And give us courage too, Lord, to... um, to then embrace, uh, embrace your wisdom, embrace uh, the things of your good life for us. And we thank you that you want it for us more than we could ever want it for ourselves. And God, we give you uh, as best we can our, our hearts this morning again uh, so that we might participate in the flourishing of your world. In Jesus' name.